election and mm. to earn my bread. Uh, mm. I'm glad that I didn't miss your lecture today. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad about it. Mm. I'm also glad that a representative of DFID and the uh, parliament are here. Excuse, could you say who you are? Uh, Evidence-based practitioner. Oh, sorry, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm uh, from Women for Justice and Women Peace in Sri okay. Lanka. Great. Great. Right, okay. Um, you emphasized systems and um, uh, you, that is very good. And whatever you said, all what you said, is a partial corollary of this report. This is a report uh, published last October by Oxford Martin Commission for Future Generations. Long term now, I, I want all the parliamentarians and all the David people to read that, all the seven billion people to read, I want. Okay, now, my question is, my question is, uh, whatever you said, uh, Dr. Joanna said, um, your answer for higher levels of thinking, I think, is needed, and that is here. Right, okay, my question is, how do you find out the, about the humanitarian aid that is denied to oppressive people by oppressive governments, such as Sri Lanka? How do you find it out? Thank you very much. Who's next? Sir, please. Uh, my name is Ken Caldwell. Uh, I'm an independent advisor to international NGOs on the effectiveness and accountability issues. Uh, I wanted to uh, insert a bit of a challenge into this, which is relates to the uh, criteria, the six criteria outlined for uh, good uh, judging of evidence, because it felt to me that was an incomplete list. My experience of the realities of humanitarian work on the ground is that there are at least three and possibly four that weren't explicitly covered by your list. Uh, one is cost effectiveness. The second is timeliness. The third is technical simplicity. In other words, can this be done with the people who are likely to be on the ground at the time the humanitarian crisis is striking? And fourthly, simplicity of reporting. Will this make sense to beneficiaries if we are serious about accountability to beneficiaries? And it strikes me that these are the issues that are often ignored in the meta-reviews of uh, evaluations of humanitarian work, but really drive a lot of the thinking and real decisions that happen on the ground. And there is an emerging, I think, an emerging uh, new approach to this, which is making these issues much more explicit in the work that uh, is being done to set MEL policies, humanitarian action, and in doing the reviews and meta-reviews. And I wanted to ask whether these are issues that were covered by your uh, review, and if so, uh, uh, what was the findings about the trade-offs involved? Thank you. Um, Ken, thank you. That was, that was very helpful. Thank you. So, ne next to Ken. Hi, um, my name is Martin Barber, and I'm a former uh, UN humanitarian. Um, if I take myself back to the mid-90s in Afghanistan, uh, one very keen agency that was providing mine risk education, sometimes known as mine awareness, uh, did a baseline study and after their project uh, evaluated the success. And the result was that if you had gone through their program of mine risk education, you were more likely to be blown up on a landmine afterwards than if you hadn't. And this was an absolutely, obviously, a devastating outcome for the people who had conducted the um, program. And it actually led to quite substantial changes in the global approach to conducting mine risk education. But it um, was an illustration of how dangerous it is for agencies to do this kind of thing seriously. And I'm picking up what John was saying. I mean, my own sense through many years of uh, watching humanitarian agencies working in the field was that they were extremely reluctant to collect the kind of baseline data at the outset of their operations that would have allowed an independent review 
of the success of their operations after they were over. And I wanted to ask Jo um, whether she feels that um, DFID is and other donors are now systematic in insisting that um, all grant beneficiaries um, identify and collect the sort of baseline data which will allow the evaluations to take place afterwards. Because far too often, and I've been involved in this myself, I did a review of the, of the SURF, we had no baseline data on which to work. Uh, it was a, a post-evaluation. How were we supposed to do it? Well, we came up with a 100-page report, so one can always um, you know, produce something out of nothing, if you like. Uh, but um, is there really an insistence on identifying and collecting baseline data? Martin, thank you for that. We'll come to Joe in a second to get a response to that. Um, I'm going to take one more question um, at this uh, this round, and uh, Morris, I, I think you wanted to, to ask it. Um, uh, it's more comments than questions, okay. I suppose. Uh, I'm Morris Herson, and I'm, I suppose I'm here in a personal capacity. Um, there's a whole series of bits between what John and Joe said that, that raised all sorts of questions in my mind. Uh, I'll start with the aggressive bit, which is so somebody said something about people ask questions for their own, if you like, that are self-serving. And it's possible to see all of this as self-serving for ALNAP. You know, ALNAP is about uh, evaluations and uh, looking at... You know, there is something behind it, that, but it, John knows that I'm not against all of this uh, by any means, but I do think that there's a, there's a question in there about why we think that more evidence is going to do a better job. Paul made a very strong case at the beginning. You know, logically, it all stacks up. It's lovely. If you like, it could become received wisdom. Well, why hasn't it? There's been a whole series of examples given, everything from the, uh, the anecdotal you know, ass assessment out of the window of a Land Rover. It hasn't changed for 30 years. I know I was arguing with people about that 30 years ago. What, what's going on that the process, if you like, isn't changing? Or if it is, what's the evidence that it's evidence that is driving the process? I agree with John whether received wisdom is the right term or not. I mean, we work on a set of assumptions. I... My experience of humanitarian work is that it's very intuitive, if you like. People get it or don't get it, and you know those people who are doing something right and doing something wrong. Now, not that that shouldn't be examined, but I don't think that the sort of the evidence argument stacks up against that, what is my perceived reality. Now, I know I've said a lot of unaccountable things in there. <laughs> but I do think there's some of those questions under, beneath all of this that need looking at as well. Thank you, Morris. That was, that was great. Thank you. Um, I wonder, could someone just help me one second with this? Uh, Alexandra, do you mind? There's a, there's a question here which echoes your, your question, Madam, about Sri Lankan. I just, can you just go back. There's so many questions here. Oh, it's just like that. Okay, fine, fine. Thank you so much. I'm all fingers and thumbs with it. Uh, it was just, um, I've got loads and loads and loads of questions from our online people. I'm just going to pick out one because I think it chimes with your question, Adam. Uh, and, and it's from uh, Serena Oligati, Senior Policy and Research Advisor on Action on Armed Violence. And it's, the question is, how do we improve the quality of data in situations of conflict where real-time data is essential to inform humanitarian action. So there's loads of questions. There's one specifically to Joe. Um, would one of you like to volunteer to go first or to, to have a go at any of these points? Could I pick up one thing that Morris Please said? do. <coughs> yep. Look, I think uh, one thing we possibly aren't doing here is separating out a little bit evidence for what. Mm. I mean wanting for examples, but um, there's a cholera epidemic in Haiti. Quite clearly, you need evidence to deal with the cholera epidemic. And that would be about water points, um, sanitation, patterns of disease, all the usual epidemiological markers. 
I'm not sure we're talking about that kind of evidence. Yeah. No, I think what we're talking about, in my mind, um, what we're chiefly talking about here are things which can, can guide broader levels of action and policy. Yeah. For example, and I use the example, the discovery, because it was a discovery that earthquakes fall on people so you get a lot of injuries. Floods don't fall on, well, floods that come up this way don't fall on people so you don't get a lot of injuries was actually a discovery. It has huge operational <coughs> significance. Right? You don't have to send medical teams off to floods, for example, or not that kind of medical team. Um, the one difficulty I've got at the moment out of all this is I'm not sure what the questions are. What are the big policy questions? Now, I've got a few of my own, largely relating to my own subject area of interest. You know, I think we're still going on about methods of famine prediction which were discredited 30 years ago. We should be able to resolve that. But what are the big questions about humanitarian policy? Because all evidence, all research begins with a question. Okay? A proposition, as Paul put it. Yeah. Now, the only way I could find getting out of those is some kind of review of evidence would begin to steer me in the direction of where the big holes are in the plot. Mm -hmm. If there are big holes in the plot. Yeah. Um, some people might have those questions already for me. I don't know. Could, could I just... Joe, please. Yeah, I mean, just, just to sort of follow on from John and, and to respond to Morris's... Um, Point, which sort of the sort of point that I think one would like to sort of have an evening in the in the pub over. Um, so I can't I can't really do justice to it. But I mean I think uh, I think the point you're raising are really important. Um, and I guess your question about why are we why are we so if I answer it in terms of why are we differed interested in this, um, it is it is genuinely because we do believe that if we understand better both the context in which we're working and whether or not what we are supporting actually works, that would be quite helpful in terms of improving outcomes. So it is as kind of open and genuine, I suppose, as that. But I think you're absolutely right in that what we have is, in a sense, around the work that we're doing is a theory of change, which Theresa and, and Tasneem have helped us to develop, which is not saying that you just need to produce lots more information, but is trying to understand how that information fits into a cycle of action. And I think part of it is around training, um, part of it's around sort of organisational incentives. There are many different points of entry, I think, for this um, debate. So it isn't just all about sort of spewing out lots of research. And I think that this what is quite sobering, going back to your point about, you know, intuition, is I think we do need to be quite careful of assuming that we do know mm -hmm. what we're doing. And I think there's quite a lot of evidence from many different arenas about exactly why that can be so so difficult. And the big systematic review we've just done in collaboration with the Wellcome Trust on Public Health was pretty sobering because I thought of out of all of the sort of sub-disciplines within humanitarian mm. action where we could be relatively confident, public health and specifically communicable diseases, we would say, that's one thing we really know about. <laughs> And what was really scary is when we opened up the box on that, we know much less than we think we do. And I think just knowing that, just knowing how confident we can or we can't be is quite, is quite important. Um, and that maybe kind of brings me up to Martin's point in terms of, um, I guess I took two things out of your observation, Martin. One was about baselines and the other was about mm. failure and about how mm. tolerant we can be in relation to finding mm. out failure. Because actually, when you were describing that case, it was extraordinarily brave of that organisation to mm, yeah. conduct that study and also allow anybody else to catch yeah. sight of it. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I think, you know, kind of less fit organisations would probably have buried it as deeply as they prob possibly could and run away from it. And I think one of the things we are working on, and I, I do recognise there are conflicting incentives, I think, for all of us in this, is how do you acknowledge failure as not, in a sense, failure, but learning, because that's what it is. It's, it's very, very deep and important learning. And I think how you systematise that is really important. In terms of baselines, I think we are getting better. 
Um, I guess I also like to try and see it in the context not only of data, but if you like, in terms of constructing theories of change, so that you can see at different points of that theory of change how confident you can be. Um, but also about what we're trying to do is, I suppose, differentiate between areas where we feel there's quite a lot of, we can be quite confident about if you do A, then B happens, from those areas where there's quite a lot of uncertainty about whether if you do A, B happens. And because in those latter cases, we would want to have a stronger m and &E component on it than in those areas where we think there's a higher level of certainty. Um, I will defer on, on the coverage point, the Sri Lanka point. Um, it's a huge challenge. I mean, one of the things that we are trying to do is to understand much better, um, if you like, the how we measure penetration of aid in these very insecure environments. And we've just launched a major study with humanitarian outcomes, which is partly using actually epidemiological methods to try to look at this question of who is receiving what in what environments and how do we know. But it's a really fraught, difficult question that we're facing in many countries, so thank you very much for raising it. I will pass to um, others on the bef other point. Before we get to Paul, I just want to pick you up on one thing, Joe, if I may, because um, you, you mentioned theories of change. Yeah. I think you have two consultants over there now, Tasmin and Teresa, who are doing the theory of change for DFID? No, so th no, not for the whole of DFID. Oh, OK. So Sorry, they're doing a theory of change, so we, um, I manage a, a programme mm. within DFID that's concerned to... Um, catalyze innovation and improve the evidence okay. base um, and so what they're doing is what they've done is help us to develop a theory of change Fine. and my point was that in that theory of change what we're trying to do is uh, our theory of change for our program is not only about producing more and more and more research reports yeah. but trying to think about what are the other things that we Fine. need to put in whether that's different support for Fine. the humanitarian academy in terms of training whether that's looking at our own business processes, okay. whether that's incentives for our own advisors to do training, all of these sorts of things right. need to happen in order for the research to then make a difference in practice. I bring it up because we have a question about theory of change. We've got so many questions from the online people. I'd just like to bring them in. It's a question uh, from Michelle Tarzilla, who is the chair of the International and Cross-Cultural Evaluation Group of the American Evaluation Association, and she says, what do you think about the limited use of theories of change in the field? I don't think you have a comment on that. I love theory of change. I, th I think it's incredibly <laughs> helpful because I think it helps you to actually do exactly what Morris is, is talking about, is to say, here am I. I think that you know, if I, spill, if I hit the glass, the water's going to fall on the floor. Why do I think that? Do I have good reason to think that? <laughs> And it's, I find them very challenging from that point of view. Let's ask if, Mark, are you feeling more comfortable now, with, with now that you've had an answer to your question? Don't? Um, I haven't had an answer. The answer is, we need an evening in the pub. Really. OK, <laughs> there's your answer. <laughs> Paul, can I move to you? There was a question specifically about your list, whether it was the, it was the right one, whether it was, it was comprehensive enough. Or yes, thank you, John. Um, I will actually contend the contention. Uh, <coughs> If, if I may, Ken, um, I think all of the things that you say I, I agree with. I don't, I, I'm not sure I would agree, agree that they are criteria for good evidence. I would suggest that those are criteria for good programs um, and that there is a difference. They, they, they seem cost effectiveness, timeliness, technical simplicity, um, <coughs> simplicity around reporting, um, seem to me to, to, to speak more closely to the OECD DAC criteria for evaluation of programs. Uh, where a good program is cost effective and is timely rather than evidence, good evidence is cost effective and is timely. But um, I recognize that also elsewhere we do say that in order for evidence to be used, it needs to be timely. So perhaps there's a point there. But these seem to be very important things, more about programs, I would argue, than, than evidence. However, uh, we could have a longer list. Um, may, I, may I just also... Um, think around the received wisdom point um, the, the, and well uh, uh, Morris's point I mean uh, yes I, I'm sure it's self-serving that Alnap writes about about this uh, has a meeting about this um, I think the important thing is that we say so you know this is the criterion of, of clarity around method who asked the question and why and I believe at the back of the report we have said something to that effect that this question was asked for um, and that's really what we're saying is that you know make make your make your you know sympathies and who is asking the question known um, on the issue the broader issue of, of, of received wisdom I mean uh, that's 
very, very interesting what John says because it, it um, makes me realise that actually in two different reports that we're, we've been working on over the last six months, we're actually saying, you know, we're holding two slightly opposing <laughs> ideas at the same time around, around leadership and special uh, standard operating procedures. We're also looking at the issue of received wisdom and how decisions get made. Um, I, think, I think what's interesting, just to underline something that I understand John to have been saying, is that often the received wisdom is implicit. It has not been made explicit what it is. It's a social fact which looks like reality. But it only looks like reality, and it's not reality. It's just something we have all agreed on. And that is incredibly dangerous. With, with re respect to, to, to our colleague from Sri Lanka, um, one, of, one example of that might be coverage. Um, the state of the system, the UNAP state of the system, I think brought up the fact that we don't know about coverage. And I mean, it wasn't the first time it had been said, but in order to actually know the proportion of population in need who'd, been, who'd received assistance, you'd have to know who was in need. And there aren't global figures for that, because the figures are often being collected by people who are responding, and there are incentives to not get the full numbers there. So that's an example of you know, any, any conversation about coverage until very recently was sort of based on a tacit not knowing. At least that's explicit, which then provides a research question, as John was saying. So one of the things about received wisdom is that if we don't say what, if we don't even know what it is, let alone say what it is, we can't create the questions to uh, address it. And I think I will stand for evidence as, as a reason for that. The, I will stand, sorry, with that as a, an argument for getting evidence to, to, to interrogate what we think is real. Um, but the other is what happens when we're not in Kansas anymore? Um, because if we have situations where actually the received wisdom, as I think John was suggesting, is a good thing, it's a heuristic, it's a decision-making, it's a way of making decisions without having to go back to first principles, and we use that received wisdom because it generally works better than doing other things. This is a good thing, until the context is so different that things that worked 99 times out of 100 only work 10 times out of 100. Uh, and I think, for example, we might be seeing that in many urban humanitarian situations. I think Joe has pointed out in the past that one of the, the kind of Kansas ideas we have is that emergencies happen really, really quickly in their rapid response. But in fact, most of the money is being spent on very long-term sequential interventions. And if you have received wisdom or best practice, which is very good until the context changes, I think you probably do need to get evidence as to what is best in the new context. So that would be a second argument for evidence. Um, <coughs> theories of change, maybe just, just to, to, to quickly address that. Um, one of the nice things that I think came out of the, the meeting on, on which much of the report is based is the attempt to look at uh, causality and attribution in much more sophisticated, much more robust ways, including RCTs. But part of the spin-off of RCTs that we're seeing is because they are expensive and are very difficult to do in many contexts and for many non-PICO type questions, there seems to be a lot of other work going on around attribution, including much more work around theories of change. Um, to, and so, so a, variety of, a variety of different approaches are being developed, including one, I see Vivian uh, here, including one that, that, that Oxfam and, and the ECB and the University of East Anglia have been looking at. So, so theories of change, maybe we'll see more of that in the future. I'd like to take just a couple of quick questions, otherwise we really are going to go over. So please, anybody? Madam, please. Um, hi, uh, my name is Leila, and uh, I'm here in my personal capacity. Um, I was thinking that whether um, we can, as a, as a community, as humanitarian workers, um, even get to a point where we can have um, meaningful evidence collected and meaningful research done just because the ways that the system is designed. Um, are we really um, welcoming um, good research and meaningful research? And what's the cost of that research for the researcher and for the organization who's doing the research? 
Um, just an example, it's not humanitarian really rela related, but um, Tim Allen at the London School of Economics did a research on tropical neglected tropical diseases two years ago. And this was uh, going on for a number of years. And basically what the research showed was um, that DFID was wasting its money. And all hell broke loose. He was threatened. The funding was threatened to be cut. The, he was being funded by uh, the Gates Foundation. Um, he was called in for a hearing. Then there was articles written about him. Um, but he was in a position. He's a professor at the LSC. You know, he he has a secured life. But what would happen for someone who's an independent researcher or who's working for an organization? And you're talking so much about impact and um, you know doing research on impact of projects and programs. If I was a manager of an organization that I wanted to my, my organization to survive and I wanted to my staff to be able to keep their jobs, do I really want my donor to see that my programs are not being effective on an impact level? You know, what are the con what are the costs for an organization and how I think we need a shift in the way we're approaching um, humanitarian business model in order to get better research and better evidence um, from the field, if you have any comments about that. Leila, thank you very much. Vivian, please. Um, it's a comment more than a question. Um, I, I mean, I like the idea of collaboration because I think for too long we've been beavering away as our, as our own agency, trying to prove that you know we did a fantastic job, we brought about impact. And I think we need to move away from that because actually we don't know the bigger question about uh, what changes have occurred. Uh, and, and we should start with that uh, rather than thinking about what we as individual agencies are doing. And actually I'd just like to mention that I've just come from a meeting this morning with the DEC that we're actually hoping to, the DEC is hoping to um, do a more collaborative um, measurement of, of change in the Philippines. And I, I think that's a really exciting way to go. Vivian, thank you. Ms. Francis, please. Um, hi, I'm Francis Stevenson from, um, from Help Age International. Um, you'd probably expect me to bang on a bit about old people, so um, <laughs> I'll just say something about... Uh, <laughs> uh, just, just, just. I'll just drop one fact in, which, um, which hopefully some people will use as evidence, which is there are more older people, people over 60, in the world today than there are children under 14. But where's the focus of humanitarian assistance? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that wasn't actually. Um, I wasn't actually going to be focusing particularly on that. Um, I was uh, particularly um, uh, impressed, as always, by what Morris had to say and about intuitive humanitarianism, because. Because it, it's right, isn't it? I mean, we all know when we see a good humanitarian that they're, that they're doing the right thing. But that, that, that's if they're doing what, what we ourselves think is the right thing. And so that's what I, I wonder if the big um, problem at, at the heart of this, why, why the research questions aren't clear, um, why, 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 you know, for instance, Help Age International banged its head against the brick wall because people don't recognize the evidence when it's staring them in the face about older people. It, is, is it the reason that we, 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 don't, we don't have the same objectives? We assume that because we put humanitarian in our job title some, somewhere, um, whether we work for, for uh, an NGO or DFID or, or, or a local organization or whatever, that we're all engaged in the same enterprise. But if, if we're not actually aiming at the same thing, if, we're if we don't have the same point at the end of our theory of change or at the top of our log frame or whatever, then, then there's no way we're going to find evidence that works for everybody. And so it's not surprising that the research questions are not clear and that the evidence is all over the place and people carry on working mm. without it. Mm. All right, good. <laughs> uh, some challenges from from Francis and, and indeed from Leila. Maybe final thoughts and reflections. Or, um, maybe uh, Joe. I think some of it was. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm 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 not going to speak at all about the Tim Allen case because I'm not aware of the facts and we're on the public record. And I think there are very serious remarks that you made and and I couldn't possibly comment um, on them. Um, but so I'll I'll stick to the more general points. Um, I think you're right that. 
that the incentives, in a sense, to listen to very difficult messages are very, comp you know, are very difficult. Um, I think, arguably, though, the costs of not doing this are very high. And I think, particularly, P Paul's point that, in a sense, I think that the scenarios that we're looking at in the future um, are not the same as the ones that we've spent time looking at, at the, in the past. And so I think between us all, and this also goes on the donor side, we have to kind of approach this with a degree of humility. And it goes back to what I was saying before, that I think if we are entering into, into contexts which are very uncertain, we have to be able to be open with each other that there is a high level of uncertainty so that we're, f we're sort of analysing that risk together, you know, both on the donors and partners side. And then we're sort of thinking seriously about how we evidence whether, you know, whether or not things, things, things work. And so I think that's never going to be easy and it requires quite a high level of trust. Um, but I think the cost for all of us of not building that trust are, are, are very high. So, I mean, I, I guess, um, you know, from a personal perspective, it's obvious, really, that, that, that that's the way where we need to be hedging. Um, Vivian, thanks very much for your, co for your, for your question. I mean, it, your comment. I mean, Francis, I think a part of what we've tried to do within DFID is, is to um, think about how we can corral our sort of research investments around a few big questions. And we did that... We were, we were sort of systematic in doing that. So we've identified these four big questions, which I won't go into. You can see them on our website. But um, I think what would be really helpful is, is how we do begin to generate a kind of shared research agenda. On the innovation side, I can see there's a potential for doing that around trying to identify what are the big problems in the context of the WHS. And I think we probably need to do the same on the research side. I think, as you've intimated, this is not one agenda. I mean, the challenge of a humanitarian research agenda is it goes all the way through from trying to understand sort of long-term climate change trends and exposure relating to seismic risk through to protection, et cetera. I mean, it's incredibly multidisciplinary. And I guess part of what we've been trying to do is to support that process of identifying these research gaps. And I think trying to bring communities together to say, well, what are our big problems? We've just done this in relation to public health. We're doing it in relation to WASH. And I think in relation to older people, it would be very useful to try and corral, you know, a group of people who are concerned around that agenda and say, look, these are the, s we can't investigate 25 questions because it's too difficult. We haven't got sufficient resource. What are the three or four things that if we could answer them, that would really change our practice? And it's trying to find those, you know, powerful questions mm -hmm. that I think we probably need to spend more time doing as well as sweating about how we invest in research to find answers. So thank you. Would like to just want to go next, Paul, so we can give, give the final word to John. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I, I have very little to say. I think mm -hmm. good points all. The, uh, the, the one point to, to, that Layla, to, to what Layla was saying, was um, a practical, a potentially practical approach to this might be to encourage uh, organizations, not just donors, but because I think often the donors are blamed for the things that the rest of us won't do. Someone's got to be kind of responsible, you know. Um, but for organisations, <coughs> I don't just say that because Joe's here, um, to think more in terms of portfolios of work mm -hmm. than individual pieces of work. Um, I think I think that's you know a fairly simple but fairly fundamental shift in thinking about success and failure, because it allows for failure as long as there is success over the broader set of activities. You can fail on some. Um, if you have to succeed on everything, you will of course take the lowest risks on everything. So uh, just as a, a perhaps a, 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 a another way of thinking that might be might be helpful for the problem you've identified. Yeah, I, I'm sorry I just jumped in. I, I really do not want to blame donors for it. I think as as a community, maybe on a I don't know self conscious level, maybe we don't want to see the real impact, or we're not really looking for it because a it's hard, b um, can be very discouraging. You know, I, I and I didn't want to. Mm. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Everyone else all right. It's yeah. fine. It's good. John, final final thoughts. Okay, mm -hmm. final thoughts. I mean, they're really just addressing the same question. But I think you know, Tim Allen can be um, reassured that he's not alone. You know, this is routine. It's a, it's an integral part of the system. And the question, and I think it probably revolves to Francis Stevenson. Yep, um, that point as well is behind all this, the big question, who sets these agendas? Whether the agenda is children, whether the agenda is 
neglected tropical diseases, whether the agenda is global immunization. And the only answer I can give is that that's politics. That's the way the world works. And although it changes over time, the only possible resistance anybody has you know, is to fight it. Now, I'm not suggesting for an instant this is easy. And the difficulty varies over time. In some ways, looking back, I mean, at the time I was out there uh, doing the street fighting, as we used to call it, it, life was a little easier in some ways because I worked for an organization that had its own money. Uh, and would give us backing right up to the trustees. And quite big money, too. Um, they couldn't get you. Um, that's a difficult, rare situation now. But it requires academics to stand up. Has Tim Allen written to the... Look, years ago, Amartya Sen wrote a paper for the UN um, coming out of his entitlement theory, right? and in which he used the example of Bengal in uh, Bangladesh, a newly formed Bangladesh famine, 71, and pointed out that um, uh, there had been this little difficulty that um, Bangladesh had uh, an export order to Cuba. The United States obviously had a blockade on Cuba. The United States had said to Bangladesh, uh, if you export jute to Cuba, um, we will withdraw food aid. Food aid was held up for a bit. And this was part of the origin of this huge price spike that caused um, really a very serious famine. Right? And Amartya said, and he said, look, I'll happily take this out of the report. Right? The sections I take out will be published in the Times newspaper tomorrow morning. Right? <laughs> now, he said it's in a very strong position. But people, I'm afraid, you know, you either find your backbone you know, or you put up with it. And at the moment, it's very difficult. This is a very closed, clamped-down study uh, situation controlled by surprisingly few people. And the same, I have to say, for the role of, you know, position of elderly in, in this. That it's a rather different origin, I think, but the fact is children look better in photographs. You know? yeah? A sorry political truth, but it's the truth. You know? yeah? So you fight your corner. You'll never win, but you might go backwards a little more slowly. You know? That's why I'm considering <laughs> leaving this field altogether. On, on <laughs> <laughs> I'm reconsidering my career path. I really want to finish on a positive note. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I still got, but I'm not sure we're going to. I think let, let's, let's finish with, with John's received wisdom on that. Um, um, unfortunately, we could go on for a lot longer. We have run out of time. Um, I'd like to thank all the online participants. We had lots and lots of questions, and I just couldn't get to them, unfortunately. But I hope uh, you enjoyed the event. I'd like to thank all of you for uh, taking part. Many stimulating questions. Thank you so much for coming. I'd like to thank Paul for the presentation. I think most of all to thank John and Joe for coming and uh, being such fantastic panellists. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>